In this video, we're going to take a look at an adapter. We'll look at all of its main parts, I'll show you how it works, and then we're going to look at some of the designs, and then we're going to have a look at some of its applications, as well as some of its advantages and disadvantages. Here is our adapter. You can see that we've got a circular fat shape on the end here. Then we've got a narrow section. Then we've got a section that gradually increases in diameter. And we've got this flange on the side here. This is our discharge flange. If we go over to the other side here, we can have a look underneath. This is where we draw secondary fluid into the adductor, also sometimes called the suction fluid. And this connection here represents our motive fluid connection. Where the motive fluid comes into the adductor, we call that our motive chest. And it goes into the adductor and it passes through a nozzle, which if we go through the cross section here, you can see that nozzle. Before we go too far into the video though and discuss the parts, let's briefly discuss what a motive fluid is and what a suction fluid is. The motive fluid represents the high pressure fluid. There's no other fluid that flows through the adductor that's going to be at a higher pressure than our motive fluid. It comes through the motive chest, then it flows through a motive nozzle and further into the adductor. The reason we say suction fluid or secondary fluid and that it comes through this flange here is because as our motive fluid flows into this converging, you can see here this line gradually converging and this one as well, as the motive fluid flows into that converging inlet nozzle, we're going to get a suction pressure and that suction is going to draw in our suction fluid also known as our secondary fluid. So that will come through this connection here. Those two fluids will then flow along here through a section that's called the throat or mixing throat. And at this point, they will then begin to pass through what's called a diffuser or diffuser nozzle, also called a diverging nozzle. Notice that the diverging nozzle gets gradually wider. It has an internal diameter that gradually increases as we progress from the left side, the suction side, to the discharge side. At this point here, our fluids have been mixed and we're going to discharge them through the discharge flange. Let's talk a little bit more about the geometry here and what's going on with the fluids. Our motive fluid comes in at high pressure. Let's imagine just for a moment that we're taking steam or maybe we're taking high pressure seawater, something like that. In fact, let's use seawater as an example. The reason I want to use seawater as an example is because, technically speaking, an eductor uses a liquid as the motive fluid. An ejector uses a gas. If we were talking about a venturi pump or a jet pump, those two terms are used to encompass both eductors and ejectors. In the engineering world, though, you'll often hear people use eductor and ejector, those two terms, interchangeably. People don't really differentiate between the two. But strictly speaking, an eductor uses a liquid as the motive fluid. An ejector uses a gas as the motive fluid. Anyway, let's stay on topic. Our eductor has motive fluid coming in here. It flows through the nozzle and the nozzle converges. The geometries that we're seeing throughout this eductor are very important. Notice here, gradually getting wider, fixed or constant diameter slightly converging here and a nozzle that converges. Why is this important? You'll hear people say, oh, it's because of Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle, yeah, sort of, but Bernoulli's principle is used as a general fluid dynamic concept. In our example here, our eductor example, it's much more accurate if we say this eductor is using what's called the Venturi effect. The Venturi effect is like Bernoulli's principle, but it's limited in terms of its application because we're using it only where the flow path of a fluid is within constrained limits. As an example, you can see here, the constraint is the pipe diameter. It's the piping itself. It is the adductor body. So keep in mind that Bernoulli's principle is a fluid dynamic concept. If you were looking at the equation for Bernoulli's principle, it includes things like pressure, density, speed, and height. When we're looking at the Venturi effect, however, 
We're focusing upon pressure, density, and velocity. Primarily, though, we're focusing on pressure and velocity, and there's a good reason for this. The Venturi effect describes the relationship between pressure and velocity within a confined space, such as a pipe. If you look at this image here, the first gauge on the left indicates the highest pressure. If you look below that on the opposite side of the pipe, you can see that the velocity is indicated as well, and it says low velocity. The middle gauge says lowest pressure, and then we've got high velocity. The gauge on the right says high pressure, and below that we have low velocity. So notice that where we have the highest pressure, we have low velocity. Really speaking, that should say lowest velocity. Where we have the lowest pressure, we have a high velocity. And where we have high pressure, we have a low velocity. What's fascinating though is look at the flow path. Notice on the left that the pipe converges. It becomes narrower. This causes a reduction in pressure and an increase in velocity. Notice then that as we go from the second gauge, where our lowest pressure is, to the right, where we have our high pressure, we get a pressure increase and a velocity decrease. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we have a pipe that's converging, this is going to cause a pressure reduction and a velocity increase. If we have a pipe that is diverging, if the internal diameter is becoming larger, then we're going to get a pressure increase and a velocity decrease. Let's take that knowledge now and see how it applies to our eductor. Here's the eductor again, take a cross section. We've got the motive fluid coming in. We've got a converging nozzle. Remember this is our motive fluid nozzle or motive nozzle. This converging shape is going to cause a pressure reduction and a velocity increase. The fluid is going to be discharged from the nozzle from left to right and into our converging inlet nozzle. Notice this converging inlet nozzle is quite small. Some converging inlet nozzles may begin roughly where my mouse is, and they will go all the way over here to the end of the throat, where my mouse is now, and the internal diameter of the pipe will gradually decrease throughout that whole length of the converging inlet nozzle. In our example though, we've actually got quite a long throat, which is unusual, but not totally unheard of. Different eductors have different lengths of throat because the length of the throat and also the length or position of the motive nozzle changes the capabilities of the eductor. If you're using it for different applications, then you're going to need to adjust the nozzle position. You're going to need to adjust maybe the length of the converging inlet nozzle and things like that. So there are different designs out there, but let's keep following our fluid. So we've got a high velocity fluid coming out of our motive nozzle. It's going to be discharged in this direction. We're now coming into the converging nozzle. And within our converging inlet nozzle, we're going to get a suction pressure that's created just at the entrance. That suction pressure is going to draw in our secondary fluid through this space here. And we're going to get the secondary fluid joining our motive fluid within the throat first within the converging inlet nozzle and then within the throat. The motive fluid will be closer to the center of the pipe and the secondary fluid will be towards the outside diameter of the pipe. We then pass through the throat and then we get to the end of the throat where our divergent nozzle begins. See here we've got the divergent nozzle. This is where we really mix the two fluids together. We get a velocity decrease. You can see that the divergent nozzle is increasing in diameter and we get a pressure increase. So velocity decrease, pressure increase, and the two fluids then that have been mixed will flow out of the discharge nozzle. So we've discussed briefly all of the main parts of an eductor and also how the eductor works. Why would we even want to use an eductor in the first place? I mean, we can just use a pump instead. The great thing about an eductor, and this is also true for an ejector and a Venturi pump and a jet pump, is that they are simplistic in design. They're very simplistic. They have no moving parts. Even if you lost electrical power, the eductor could still work providing you had a motive fluid that flows through it. As an example, let's imagine you've got a water tank that's stored at height, and this is going to be our motive fluid. It represents stored potential energy. If we connect the tank to our eductor and we put the motive fluid through our motive fluid inlet here, 
or the motor fluid chest, and then through the nozzle, we can then draw in a secondary fluid. If we've got an area that we do not want to be flooded, for example, maybe a cellar or a basement, then we can connect the secondary suction side here to the bottom of our cellar or basement. And what's going to happen is if we lose power, we're going to have a valve on this side here. We lose power, that electromagnetic valve, the solenoid valve, because it's lost power, goes to the open position. That allows water to flow through this connection here. And because the tank where we're drawing the water from is at height, we've got pressure. The pressure represents our motive fluid pressure. If we've got motive fluid pressure, then because we're passing it through a nozzle here and we're passing it through the rest of the adductor, we can draw through the secondary fluid through this connection here. This is quite useful because if we lose electrical power and our cellar or basement begins to flood for whatever reason, it doesn't matter because we've got a backup method of drawing our secondary fluid in here in order to ensure that our cellar or basement does not flood whenever we have a power outage. With this example here, we've got our eductor. On the left side, we've got a water inlet. The lower side of the eductor is where we draw in our secondary fluid. And you can see where we're drawing in the secondary fluid, it's connected to a plastic hose. We put the end of this hose into a bucket or maybe into a container. The container is full of foam solution. We draw the foam solution in as the water flows through our adductor and we get foam. We can then use this foam for firefighting purposes. So a simple adjustment to our firefighting nozzle by installing an adductor within the firefighting nozzle, we can then create foam. If we remove the secondary suction connection, then we can just use water for firefighting purposes instead. We can also use this design as an ejector and we can use the ejector for, as an example, generating a vacuum on a steam turbine condenser. If you're working on a ship, a large commercial vessel, you will definitely see ductors and ejectors as well. Here is a freshwater generator that you would see on a large ship. And if we zoom in, do you recognize this part? That is our ejector. We're going to use the ejector to generate a vacuum within our freshwater generator. And that vacuum then is going to be used to lower the boiling point within the freshwater generator. This is really useful because the engine discharges heat, but it doesn't discharge heat at the temperature we want to boil water under ambient conditions. It's at a lower temperature, or I should say the cooling water systems at a lower temperature. So we need to reduce the boiling point of seawater in order that we can boil it at a lower temperature and create fresh water. The ejector is what allows us to do this because we reduce the pressure in the freshwater generator, we create a vacuum, and that means that the boiling point of the water decreases also. Another usage for an eductor on a large ship would be as a bilge pump. We can run seawater through our eductor and draw out bilge water, which we can then transfer to a holding tank or to a treatment tank, or potentially even overboard if this is allowed. Obviously, there's a lot of laws and regulations concerning what you can pump off a ship. Keep in mind also that because there's no moving parts, because there's no electrical connections or anything like that to this eductor, you can also use it in hazardous environments. For example, if we're installing this within an explosive environment where it has to be intrinsically safe, this eductor might be a very good alternative to using an electric pump. As I mentioned, they can be used for different fluids. This includes liquids, gases, slurries, and things like that. So they have a wide range of applications. However, they do have some limitations. They have quite a low efficiency compared to mechanical pumps. And this is because we're converting energy from pressure to velocity and then back from velocity to pressure again. These conversions cause a decrease in overall efficiency. The performance of an eductor is directly dependent on the pressure and flow rate of the motive fluid. If we have a motive fluid that has a pressure drop or a low flow rate, then our eductor will no longer work. Controlling the flow through an eductor is also quite difficult. You don't always know how much flow you're going to get through an eductor. And this is especially true if the motive fluid flow is not stable. High viscosity fluids, that is to say fluids that have a high resistance to flow, 
they are also not best suited for an adductor. This is mostly because the suction lift that we generate via our adductor has to be very, very strong if we're going to be sucking up highly viscous fluids. The resistance to flow is so high that we might not generate enough suction in order to use an adductor for that purpose. That's the end of another Savory Snacks video. I really do hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel or follow me on LinkedIn if you want to be notified whenever we release a Savory Snacks video. Thank you very much for your time.